Have you ever had a situation, maybe a conflict or something like that, where somebody that you were in relationship with was acting completely out of character? And you may have even said to them, who are you right now? I, what, what is going on here? Who are you? You're not showing up the way that I expect you to show up. Show of hands, have you ever had a conversation or a, a conflict like that? Yeah, and all the married people said. <laughs> As we come to our text this morning in Matthew 11, we find John the Baptist, or I like to call him Jay the B. So Jay the B has been thrown into prison by Herod Antipas. Herod had ditched his wife for whatever reason and decided that he liked his brother's wife better. And so he decided, you know what, brother, I'm taking your wife to be my wife because I like her better than my wife. So old wife, you're out. Brother's wife, you're in. And not surprisingly, John had confronted him about this, to which Herod did not take kindly and had John locked up. John's imprisonment had caused him to question whether Jesus really was who John had thought him to be. Essentially, John was saying, Jesus, who are you? John sent two of his followers to ask Jesus an important question. Was Jesus the one John and his followers had been looking for, or should they look for someone else? Jesus gives John his answer, and it may not have been entirely the answer that John was hoping for. I know that none of us have ever experienced that when we've come to the Lord with questions, right? We've never had the Lord answer our questions and not exactly give us the answer we were hoping for. None, none of us have ever experienced that. Well, that was John's experience, and we're going to see three principles in our text this morning that we can draw on when we find ourselves wrestling with the same questions that John had. The first principle that we see in our text this morning is this, everyone has doubts and questions. Everyone has doubts and questions. Matthew chapter 11, verse 1, it says this, Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. You can go ahead and throw up that slide there, Dante. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one or do we look for another? Everyone has doubts and questions. We can sometimes fall into the trap of thinking there's something wrong with us or we're somehow defective in our faith when we have doubts or questions. We can think, man, everybody else has got it together. Everybody else has got their faith completely figured out and I must be the messed up one because I've got questions and I've got doubts. And I just want to encourage you this morning, you are not the messed up one. At least not for that reason. You may be the messed up one for some other reason. I may be the messed up one for some other reason. But having doubts or questions does not mean there's anything wrong with you. Like John, we may find ourselves full of faith and certainty in one moment and wrestling with doubts and questions the next. The verses that we started with a few minutes ago show that John is full of confidence in who Jesus is and what he came to do. John realizes that Jesus was the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. In verse 35 of John 1, John said, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. In that moment, John was not doubting. He was confident in who Jesus was. He was confident that Jesus was the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. He was confident that Jesus was the Son of God. And yet, when John was going through some difficulties, it caused him to question and wrestle with doubts. I'm encouraged by this. If someone like John, who had baptized Jesus, who had seen the Holy Spirit descend upon him, who had heard the voice of the Father from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. 
If someone like John could have doubts and questions, it encourages me to know that it's okay if sometimes I have them too. Don't we experience the same thing that John did sometimes? Many of us have seen God do amazing things in the hearts and lives of our friends and family members. We've seen God do amazing things in our own hearts and lives, and yet we can still get discouraged and wrestle with doubts. Perhaps the most famous doubter in the Bible, his name is Thomas, is an example of someone who had been very close to Jesus and still struggled with doubts. By the way, how would you like to be immortalized for two or 3,000 years based on, on some issue that you had wrestling with your faith, right? Like, hi, I'm Lisa the liar, because you told a lie one time, right? Or I'm, you know, Lusty Bob. I'm David the drunkard. You think, man, I, I don't want to be immortalized for two or 3,000 years based on, on some struggle that I had along the way, but poor Thomas, that's, that's what he's been saddled with. We all know, doubting Thomas. Well, look at John chapter 20, verse 24. It says this, now Thomas called the twin, one of the 12 was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. I think Thomas gets a bit of a bum rap. He didn't say that he wouldn't believe. He said he wouldn't believe unless he saw the resurrected Jesus. Given that he had seen Jesus be crucified and die, uh, given that he had had his hopes and his dreams dashed when Jesus died on the cross, given that his friends had all seen the resurrected Christ, I don't think it was unreasonable for Thomas to say, I want to see him too. I'm not going to believe until I see the resurrected Jesus. Thomas wanted to see Jesus. Thomas sought Jesus in his doubts, and so should we. When we have doubts, when we have questions, where should we go with them? We should seek Jesus. We should go to Jesus and say, Jesus, show me who you are because I'm struggling with doubts and concerns and questions right now. Jesus invites us to seek him when we wrestle with our doubts, and he allows us to be reassured by his loving presence. I love the fact that Jesus didn't scold Thomas. He said, Thomas, come here. See my hands. See my side. Touch them. Touch me. To be sure, Jesus did call Thomas to move from unbelief to belief, but he did so with love and with grace, and he offers us the same love and grace that he offered to Thomas when we struggle with doubts. The same invitation to trust and believe in him. A big buzzword right now that you all may have heard is the word deconstruction or the idea of people deconstructing their faith. Raise your hand if you've heard of that. If you've heard that term, heard about people deconstructing their faith or going through deconstruction. Often this involves people tearing down everything that they've believed about God, the gospel, the Christian faith, and reconstructing their beliefs. The problem with most of these deconstructors is not that they have doubts or questions, it's that they go to the wrong sources with them. Where should we go when we have doubts or questions about our faith? Should we look within ourselves for the answers and follow our hearts? No. 
Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us that our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. Why would I want to go to a source that is deceitful and desperately wicked to answer my questions and my doubts? Why would I do that? Is that going to lead me into truth or is that going to lead me into error? When I look to my heart for the answers, I'm not going to find the right answers. How about this? Should we look to our culture, psychology, or our political leaders for the answers to our faith questions? No, please don't. Please don't look to a politician for the answers to your faith questions. Even the ones who profess to follow Christ, don't look to them to answer your doubts and your questions. We should look to Jesus, who the Bible tells us is the living word of God. He's the word became flesh who dwelt among us. Look to the Bible, God's written word. See, when we search the scriptures for answers to our doubts and look to Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, by the way, not some new Jesus, not some hippy-dippy Jesus that only tells us what we want to hear, But when we look to the Jesus of the Bible and when we look to the word of God, we can't go wrong. In Mark chapter 9, verse 23 and 24, a man had brought his son who was demon-possessed to Jesus. They had brought him to the disciples, but the disciples couldn't help him. They tried and they were like, we got nothing. We can't do this. So the man brought his son to Jesus. Verse 23, it says, Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. This ought to be our response when we wrestle with doubts and with questions. It's, Lord, I believe, but would you help me with my unbelief? God, I believe that your word is true. Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are, that you came to do what you said you came to do, that you will do what you have said you will do. But Lord, would you help me with my unbelief? Would you help me with my doubts, my worries, my concerns, my questions? Because when we do that, we can't go wrong. Bring our concerns, our doubts, our questions to Jesus and ask him to help us with our unbelief. Because everybody, at one time or another, deals with doubts or questions. Second principle we see in our text this morning is this. Sometimes Jesus doesn't do what we expect him to do. Have you experienced that in your Christian walk? Sometimes Jesus doesn't do what we expect him to do. We have these expectations for him that he's going to act in a certain way or in a certain time frame, and then when it doesn't happen, we get disappointed and discouraged. We see that in verse 4 of Matthew 11 here. It says this, speaking to John the Baptist, Jesus answered and said to them, go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Whether we verbalize them or not, all of us have expectations of God. All of us have things that we expect that God will do and timing in which we expect God will do those things, whether we speak them out or not, and when they don't happen, when God doesn't do what we hope he will do, when a situation happens differently than we hoped or prayed for, it can be really easy to get discouraged and begin to doubt. John was no different than us. He had heard and seen a powerful witness of who Jesus was, But when Jesus acted differently than what John expected, he was confused. This led him to wonder whether Jesus really was the Messiah or if he should look for someone else. Jesus' reply to John's disciples would have been instantly familiar to John from the Messianic prophecy in Isaiah chapter 35. See if you notice as we read these verses what Jesus included from this prophecy in his response to John and what he left out. Isaiah 35, verse 3. 
It says, strengthen the weak hands, make firm the feeble knees, say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong and do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For water shall burst forth, burst forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. What did Jesus leave out when he responded to John's question? Anybody know? He left out the vengeance and wrath part of the prophecy. See, John, like many other Jews of his time, had this expectation that when Messiah came, he would overthrow the Roman rule and reestablish the kingdom of God on earth with the people of Israel. And when that didn't happen, John was confused. He didn't understand. He didn't understand that that was not Jesus' plan, not then anyway. Can I tell you, there indeed will come a day when Jesus returns to bring judgment and wrath on those who have rejected him. That part of the prophecy will come to pass. We read about it and recently covered it in Revelation 19. But the Jews, including John, expected that Jesus would fill the entire prophecy of Isaiah 35 all at once. They didn't understand that there would be two layers of fulfillment of that prophecy. Jesus' plan was to fulfill that prophecy not in one coming, but in two comings. His first coming in the incarnation, Jesus became the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He came to ride into Jerusalem, not as a conquering king on a war horse, but on a donkey, humble and meek. Jesus came as the suffering servant, the good shepherd who would lay down his life for his sheep. When Jesus comes again, he will not come as the suffering servant, but as the lion of Judah. He will come as the conquering king described in Revelation 19.15. It says, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of God Almighty. Jesus will fulfill that prophecy in Isaiah 35, but he did not fulfill it in the timing in which John and many of those uh, Jews of John's time believed that it would happen. So here's John sitting in prison and he's going, what's going on? I thought Messiah was going to overthrow the Romans and instead they've thrown me in prison. After I've faithfully served God, here I am rotting in a Roman prison. Jesus, what's going on? Why are you not showing up the way I expected you to show up? Why are you not doing what I expected you to do? Side note, if you've never met Jesus, the Lamb of God, who came to take away your sin, I want to plead with you today. Don't wait. Don't wait. Because I can assure you of this, you do not want to meet the Lion of Judah before you have met the Lamb of God who takes away your sin. Because that will be a very different meeting. For those of us who have met the Lamb of God, who have put our faith and our trust in Christ for salvation, who have believed in him, repented of our sin, we are going to come with the Lion of Judah when he rides on that white horse to bring victory and to bring judgment on his enemies. We will ride with him in victory and that will be an incredible day. For those who don't know Christ, who have never met the Lamb of God, that's going to be an incredibly bad day because it's going to be too late. And they're going to experience the wrath and the judgment of God rather than the love and the mercy of God that we've experienced in Christ as we come to him as the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. Jesus reassures John that even though he's not acting as John expected him to, he is still the Messiah and he will still accomplish all that he came to do. Jesus offers us the same reassurance when he doesn't act the way we expect him to be to act. To be clear, Jesus will always uphold his word. He is the word became flesh. 
The word tells us heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word never will. However, he may not always act according to our schedule or our time frame. Sometimes we have a schedule of events for God, like, okay, God, I've got your schedule laid out for you. First, God, you're going to do this, and then you're going to do this, and then I'm going to be so happy, and then you're going to do this, and then you're going to do this. And what happens is oftentimes God's timing, God's schedule is different than ours. Because believe it or not, God didn't come to fulfill your expectations for him the way you define them. God came, Jesus came to fulfill the scriptures. He came to fulfill what he said he would do, and he works according to his time schedule, according to his wisdom that doesn't always line up with ours. In seasons of our lives that we are waiting and wondering, and I would imagine some of us are in that place right now where you're waiting and you're wondering, going, okay, Lord, what's going on? I've prayed and I expected you to show up in this situation. Where are you? Nothing's happening. Nothing's happening with this illness. Nothing's happening with this trial. Nothing's happening with what's going on in my life. Are you the one that I should look for or should I look somewhere else? I just want to encourage you in those seasons of waiting and wondering, cling to Jesus. Cling to the truth of his word. We may not understand why circumstances are the way they are or why God is not moving in the way or the time we hoped for, but we can trust in faith that his word is true, that he is, was, and will be faithful, and he will always do what his word says he will do. Third principle we see in our text this morning is this. God will use those who are surrendered to him. Verse seven in Matthew 11, it says, as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind, but what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses, but what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. God will use those who are surrendered to him. John was one of the most well-differentiated people in the pages of Scripture, By that I mean this, John clearly understood who he was and who he was not. When asked, John, are you the Messiah? Are you the one who is to come? John said, no, I'm not. That's not me. I am not the one that you're looking for. John had developed quite a following. Many people came out to hear from John, to be baptized by him, And the temptation for people that develop a following is to do whatever they can do to hold on to that following. Whether that's a a politician, whether that's a ministry or a church or uh, a celebrity, the temptation is I want to do whatever I can do to hold on to my followers. I certainly don't want to let them go and see them go to someone else. John understood that his role was to prepare the way for Jesus. When asked about those who were leaving him and following Jesus instead of him, he said this in John chapter 3, verse 26. It says, And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan to whom you've testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ and I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the bride of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease." 
John had joy in fulfilling God's purpose for him because he was fully surrendered to the Lord and his plans. John understood that his role was to decrease and Jesus' role was to increase. This should be the cry of every believer's heart. Jesus, let you increase and let me decrease. Jesus, let you be the one that people see in my life. Let them see more of you and less of me. When people hear from me, when they see me, when they uh, are with me, Jesus, let me decrease and let you increase so that when people see me, they would see more Jesus and less me. That ought to be the cry of all of our hearts. John clearly wrestled with how Jesus acted as the Messiah, but he didn't wrestle with his own role. He was there to humbly serve and glorify Jesus. And when we have that same mindset, God will use and bless us. When we seek nothing more than to glorify and obey Jesus with our lives, he says, there's a person I can use. When we're trying to puff ourselves up and increase ourselves, God can't use people like that. I mean, God can use anybody. He used a talking donkey. But follow me. If you want to be used effectively for God in a way that glorifies him and brings joy to you, you have to be willing to surrender to him and allow him to increase and yourself to decrease. So how do we go about surrendering our lives to God? It's easy to say, oh, surrender to God, but I don't want to send you out those doors without some practical ways that you can do that. So here are some ways that we surrender to God so that we can be used by him. Number one, there's the initial surrender to Christ that all of us who have come to faith in him experienced. It's when we repent of our sin and we believe the gospel and we come to salvation in Jesus, we surrender our lives to him. And in that moment, we say, God, I'm no longer choosing to live for myself. I'm choosing to turn from my way, to turn to your way, to repent, to follow you and obey you. I'm surrendering my life to you. There's that initial surrender. Don't you all wish that that just did it? Don't leave me hanging up here. Don't you wish that that just did it? Like you, did, you surrendered one time and it was a done deal forever? I would sign up for that deal. But here's the problem that most of us have, right? We surrender things to God. We bring them to the altar. We lay them down. Jesus, I surrender all. We surrender it all before Jesus. And what happens tomorrow? Somehow, magically, we've taken all those things back that we surrender to Jesus yesterday. Sunday morning, we come and we pray and we surrender. God, I surrender all these things to you. And Monday morning, somehow we magically discover that those things have been taken back by us. So there's that initial surrender to Jesus, but there is an ongoing surrender to our lives daily as the Holy Spirit sanctifies us and makes us more like Jesus and convicts us of our sin. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you have to take up your cross daily and follow me. That means daily we are surrendering to the lordship of Jesus in our lives. Daily I'm saying, Jesus, I am choosing to die to myself. I'm choosing to die to my will, my ways, my desires, my plans and purposes. I'm dying to those things. I'm surrendering to you. I'm taking up my cross and following you and surrendering my life as a person in Christ. So that's a daily act of surrender there's also a surrender to God's plans and purposes for our lives as we seek him for direction and trust him as he leads us. God has a plan and a purpose for every single one of our lives. If you are breathing right now, and I'm happy to see that it looks like everybody is, if you're breathing right now, God has plans and purposes for your life you are here for a reason. Even if you can't see that reason, even if you don't know what it is, God has plans and purposes for you. If he didn't, you would be underground instead of above ground. 
So there's a surrender to God's plans and purposes where we say, like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, God, not my will, but yours be done. God, you lead me in the way that you have me to go. You open the doors that you have for me to go through. You close the ones that you don't. Lord, you lead me to work the place you've called me to work. Lord, you lead me to do the things you've called me to do. Lord, you lead me to the area of ministry you've called me to and make that clear to me so that I can surrender to you your plans, your will, and your purposes. As we do that, God will use us. And isn't that a wonderful thing to be used by the Lord? Is there anything better than that? Than discovering that my life is surrendered to Christ and God is using me. He's using me to glorify himself. He's using me to be a light and a witness in the world that he's placed me. There's really nothing better than that. So I just encourage you as we close, if you have doubts and questions, bring those to Jesus. Dig into God's word and find the answers to your doubts and questions in the person, work, and word of God. When Jesus doesn't do what you expect him to do, when you expect to do it, don't get discouraged. Continue to press into him, trust him, look to him, fix your eyes on him. Faithfully follow him. And know that as you fully surrender your life to God, he's going to use you and he's going to be glorified in and through your life. Amen?